I was not ready for the jump in quality from Season 1 to 2. When I reviewed the Owl House originally, one of my main issues was how little many of the plot elements mattered, and skipping many of them wouldn't change the viewing experience. Of course I loved it. My issues were mostly minor, but even so, Season 2 has completely changed the game. Every single episode so far has been amazing. Episodic shows for the most part tend to have issues with tying everything together into a larger narrative, but the Owl House Season 2 doesn't. Every side event has some effect on the larger story. All of the characters are fleshed out with each progressing in their own way, and even beyond the grand narrative. Each episode shows a really interesting element of the Boiling Isles. The episodic storytelling found in TV shows generally has a dilemma of making events and in individual episodes feel meaningful. Some forego trying for a fully episodic format that almost resets the characters after each episode. Some of the more successful shows like Regular Show and Adventure Time were able to master the medium and really paved the way for the rest of the format. The goal is to take a plot that can stand by itself while allowing smaller events to tie into a grander narrative. It allows the world to feel more whole than even movies can achieve because of how much normal life experience we get to see. A great example is episode 5 of the Yellow House season 2 through the Looking Glass Ruins. It focuses on Gus and his doubts about illusion magic. In the previous couple episodes of Season 2, and even Season 1, he starts having doubts about his core abilities. Because none of his spells create anything physical, people make fun of him and other illusion users. Something that hasn't really been explored yet is the hierarchies among witches, and Gus's arc so far has had this ruminating in the background. When trying to help his friends, and even himself, his illusions keep coming up short. During his internal struggle, he sees a group of witch vigilantes from a rival school helping someone who was being attacked. Knowing the group and admiring them, he is honored when he's invited to join them on an expedition to the Looking Glass Ruins, said to contain items of tremendous power. A previous character that caused him a lot of issues, Bartholomew, Maddie for short, sheds doubt in his ability to help the group at all, further playing into his insecurities. This setup speaks directly to his character and struggles. He hides the fact he's an illusion user by using Luz's paper caster, but by the end he uses illusions in more creative ways, to save the ruins and the orbs of power being secured there. Going from just simple illusions, to changing your own visual form is a pretty big step up, since it affects the main issue he was contending with. To top it off, Maddie ends up agreeing to protect the ruins alongside him, creating a new bond to explore. The other half of the episode is what really had me excited though. Luz is going to the library in search of an old human diary, along with Amity, who is now properly her love interest. They work together while also dealing with their feelings towards one another. I love romance storytelling, and the writing for it here is so damn compelling. The show was made with a younger audience in mind, and as such, the romance is about the awkwardness of growing up and experiencing new relationships. It does a fantastic job portraying that experience. The cuteness of their feelings and behavior is the focus. Season 1 was about their budding friendship, and by the end their feelings were left ambiguous. In Season 2, however, they both like each other and start dating early on. It allows the story to explore their feelings and to develop the relationship beyond an end of the series kiss moment. Getting together shouldn't be the ending moment, but an aspect to explore as they grow. It creates a shallow ending for those characters, but even before the mid-season finale, we get to have them together as a status quo, adding another element to this perfectly weaved plotline. It allows for more representation for LGBTQ plus people. If all they did was have them get together by the end, it can cheapen what otherwise could be a good chance to have more types of relationships on display. Obviously, they'll have a lot of twists and turns. That's probably the part I'm most excited to see in the coming episodes. Aside from their cute as hell relationship, the other part of season 2 that really hit home for me was how much more experimental each episode felt. In season 1, there was a formula of sorts. There would either be some personal struggle for Luz, an aspect of the world to be introduced, or some expectation she has that's going to be subverted. This wasn't bad, but it did lead to some of the episodes feeling a bit samey, and some of them even feeling a bit like filler. Season 2, however, is completely different, and you can really tell how much more freedom the creators expressed with it. The format follows multiple characters at once, shows many more aspects of the Boiling Isles that we didn't even get a glimpse of, as well as part of the human world, and everything is presented in an interesting way. Two episodes that come to mind are Knocking on Hootie's Door and the most recent mid-season finale. Knocking on Hootie's Door is probably tied for my favorite episode season 2 so far, alongside Echoes of the Past. In Knocking on Hootie's Door, we follow Hootie, as he's writing a letter about how he helped everyone in the house. In this first-person, second-person diary-type perspective, we get to see how Hootie really does things. Not not only does this episode have him as the main focus, but everyone progresses with their personal struggles at the same time. King learns about his ability to roar a wave of sound. Ida was able to collaborate with her owl curse, and can now transform into a harpy form. And best of all, Luz and Amity confess their feelings for each other, and start to date. If you're going to make a side episode that's all about one character, and the comedy they bring, this is a perfect framework for how to do it. Not only does each character get a moment for themselves to grow, but Hootie himself gets a lot of characterization. Though to be fair in season 2 overall, he gets a lot more attention which is nice. This episode leads into a major aspect of this season, and show as a whole. 
representation. It can be a tricky subject to tackle, especially when trying to include those elements into older works. Some people say a character should remain how it always has been, and shouldn't be changed. For a lot of cases, this isn't a one-to-one, -one, because a lot of characters were a certain way because they weren't allowed to be anything else. But as times change, we're starting to see more and more characters of many origins. And in this case as well, orientations appear more prominently. Loses I'm assuming only into women, though it's possible she's bisexual too, which hasn't been allowed in younger entertainment for a long time. Steven Universe is a modern example of a show made for younger audiences, and the only way they could get away with it is for all of it to be metaphorical. Representation is pretty much always a good thing for stories, because it allows the work to be varied with its material. The only exception would be using diversity and inclusion as a way to make money in an egregious way, or when for whatever reason it begins to impact the story itself, but that isn't that common of an issue. And beyond the work itself, it allows more and more people to be included in some of their favorite mediums. I love it. And this show is an amazing example of great representation for younger people. It doesn't need to be complex, dramatic, played up, or anything. It's two people who are falling in love. And that's all it has to be. And that kind of normal. Especially for those who have been marginalized throughout history. It's special. The other episode I mentioned, Yesterday's Lie, changes things up with being all about Luz and a new character V, a basilisk. The main part that sold me instantly is the change of perspective. Luz can only appear in reflections. She learns that V has been taking her place ever since she left the Boiling Isles, and has actually formed quite the life. She's sweet, she had a great time at camp, and has an internal struggle about Luz. She's grateful that her being gone allowed her to escape and find a new life, but hates her for leaving her mom behind for all this time. There was some world building given for the human realm, specifically for the museum curator, who's been watching all the paranormal activities happening in the area. Luz tells her mom the truth, and it helps the audience reconnect with her struggles about finding her way home. It's beginning to create a wedge between the human world and the Boiling Isles. There's so many people she's come to care about, like Ida, King, and especially Amity, which makes the idea of leaving so hard. In one way or another, she promised she will never leave either side, which does foreshadow that she might be forced to make a choice. Though I'm rooting for her to stay on the Isles. When writing episodic shows that focus heavily on world building, character development, and themes for younger audiences, it's important to make sure everything feeds into your main ideas, even if only subtle. And I can't not talk about the other characters, or more specifically how well each of them are treated. Of course, Luz and Amity are given great character moments, alongside the plot's development, but so does everyone else. And by everyone, I kinda mean everyone. Ida gains a newfound understanding of her curse, how the Owl Beast existed on its own at one point, and is now forced to be trapped inside her. It's kind of like a Bruce Banner Hulk dynamic, where progress is found in them learning to live alongside one another. King gets a lot more history on his past, and we get teased about a character that is related to him in some way. Hootie is given a lot more spotlight than in Season 1, and has become more rounded as a character. In Season 1, he's mostly used for gags, but through his interactions with Lilith, we begin to understand him better. In my opinion, he is less annoying this time around, and though he was funny before, he is leagues better now, also because of the season's greater focus on horror-like elements. More on that in a second. Hootie is shown in a lot more interesting ways. The fact he can be carried around in a birdhouse-like backpack leaving a gross organ-like hole in the house door was something I didn't know I needed to see, but maybe I could have remained oblivious to it. Lily as well is shown a lot more, and is definitely a more effective foil to Ida. Instead of being a central antagonist, she pairs well with Hootie, which helps him as a character. Gus gets a lot more spotlight, and Willow is shown a lot less, which is good since most arcs revolving around her stopped being intriguing after the first couple episodes. The new antagonist Hunter was a great swap in for Lilith. He serves as a close tie to Bellows, so we're able to see him as a more varied villain. We've seen enough of his cruel, detached aspects, but with Hunter we get to see his calm and more parent-like demeanor. This isn't to say that Hunter spared his anger though. His developing arc is really interesting, and I'm curious what his palisman has to do with that journey. Every single character has become so well developed, and the world building is all the better for it. The biggest thing for me is how this episodic show has managed to get the best of both worlds. Every second of each episode is filled with substance, while also being fun to watch by itself. Sometimes filler can actually weaken a story overall, because it can weaken the attachment to the plot. One big jump between the seasons is the horror-like elements. When you think of horror, you probably think of a movie or story's ability to scare you, but there's a lot more to it. Horror elements are really about ways a story adds to tension, unease, or even the type of visuals at play. I wasn't super scared by seeing Hootie's organs, or some of the dark creatures on display, but does have horror-like elements. Think of the types of things you'd see in a horror movie but in a new context, and I hope more stories try to incorporate elements of horror, without feeling obligated to find ways to scare people because of it. It seems that season 3 will be a lot shorter than the first two, and might be the end. 
So for any of you that are fans of the series, make sure you go watch it on Disney+. Plus. If you help with the numbers, maybe the series can continue, like with Infinity Train, which I also covered on the channel alongside the Owl House Season 1, which I'll link in the card above, and the description. What do you all think of the Owl House so far? How is its representation? Where can it improve? Who are your favorite characters? Let me know in the comments below. And if you haven't already subscribed, it's free and you can unsubscribe later on if you want. I hope to see you next time.